Well, uh, when I initially thought I would uh, stand up here and give you some information, I was thinking of the uh, connections that we were having, uh, we, we did with this project with Richard, uh, which was uh, uh, archaeology and rock art in, the, in this area of Bhutan, but um, I realized that there's so little to tell you about that that I, I better do something different because there are only two or three instances where we have really clear correspondence between rock art uh, and settlement archaeology. And obviously the Mongolian deer is one of the main ones. But what I thought I wanted to do in reviewing um, the possibilities was to give you a, a long uh, historical rundown of, of the work that we've done primarily in Balut, uh, in the Balut area. <clears throat> because it just struck me that so much of the archaeology that we were seeing was dealing with ritual, either mortuary or other ritual activities. It's, it's basically almost the only thing that you see in the landscape. And this is true over a lot of northern Mongolia, but particularly true in, in the Altai area. And unlike uh, Hovskol and other areas of northern Mongolia, where it's limited largely to Bronze Age uh, and a little bit later, uh, in the western part of Mongolia, we have a, a, just a long, long history, uh, as you'll see, of this kind of uh, archaeological and <clears throat> ritual kind of activities. So um, just uh, I wanted to impress you with the sort of, if you, if you stretch your mind back into the past, and think about living in this environment with its uh, fantastic winters and its huge storms in the summertime, violent thunderstorms come through. It's, it's a very magical and dangerous place. And you were relying on initially animals, uh, which kept you alive, and later on uh, your flocks and so on, as well as the animals. So the supernatural was a, a major factor in, in your life. Uh, and, and I think when we look at the archaeological signs of this in this in this region, you are really impressed by how dominant uh, that kind of consideration is. You are always worrying and wondering what's going to happen to you, and you always knew that it had very little to do with what you were capable of influencing. You were basically a pawn in this big environmental system, and there were major uh, spirits and factors that you could not control. So a lot of what we see, I think, is a reflection of that kind of mentality. And I just threw in a couple of pictures, including some of the Eskimo material from ethnographic Alaska, uh, just to give you uh, the idea that this stuff is not unique to Mongolia. It's something that happens all over the northern world and has continued right up into the present. So this is the region. Uh, we don't need to dwell on that. Uh, pretty dramatic countryside. Uh, impossible to take a boring picture, uh, you know. Um, this is, uh, I think this is Bayer Saikon, although maybe it's not, but he's been one of our major partners. Um, and this is a place where we thought we might have some Paleolithic uh, archaeological material. Richard has picked up some in Serendagba as well, but it's a, it's a very ephemeral trace, but there is, uh, there is early occupation. Uh, and we know there's uh, lake sediments that date back to 40,000 years ago, which is kind of like the same sort of story beginning to come out of the uh, rock art testing and, and uh, the varnish. Uh, so there's an awful lot to be told here. Um, and in rela relating to Esther's comment, um, it would be pretty hard to reinitiate uh, glaciation in, in these areas that would affect the rock art, you know, 6,000 years ago. There's a, this is a huge basin that would require filling, the whole basin filling up with ice. <clears throat> and I think after the end of the ice ages, that basically uh, probably did not happen, although there'd be uh, mountain glaciations, which would affect high level places. So uh, this is the deer stone stuff, and I, I, want, I don't want to go into deer stones because you all know about that. Uh, we've been talking about that for years. Uh, we still need to have a lot more work. We're very Mongolia dominated in this. There's much more data uh, surrounding uh, the area, but uh, it does give you some sense of the concentration in the central areas. There's a lot of stuff out in the West that is not well known and well documented, uh, and it's uh, quite different. Um, it has more to do with the Cyan Altai and Eurasian kinds of uh, stones. The rock types are different. Uh, much of it is covered with graffiti. Um, 
This is a stone we found from the Hubskull area, which is interesting because it's, uh, it has many features of the classic deer stone uh, art, but it also has uh, Scythian style narrative art uh, embedded in it as well. So it's a, unfortunately not a, not a dated artifact. It was a stone that was, uh, we found buried, but we couldn't find uh, datable material with it. So it's an interesting transitional period probably. This is Yadag, and I just wanted to mention very briefly that there's some Scythian elements in the big deer stones here, but there, there is these small stones you see in the upper part of the excavation. They're only a couple, about a foot high. They're deer stones. They have, they have circles and belts on them and so on. But it just emphasizes the fact that we don't know, uh, we really don't know what to do about the typology yet. Uh, there's three types that uh, Volkov defined. Uh, they do seem to hold up, but the spatial dimensions where they're found uh, is really unclear. It, we, found, uh, we found copper slag in this site, uh, and we got good radiocarbon dates of 2,400 years calibrated B BP. So this is uh, kind of late stuff that goes well with the Scythian elements, uh, but it's, it has a lot of these so-called Eurasian-type deer stones uh, in this site at the same time, and I think they probably date about the same time the copper slag. Uh, here's Baisai Khan and one of our field assistants with a little deer stone. I mean, these things are, there's all sorts of variation that uh, has not been explored in, in, the, in the work on the deer stone concept. Some of the stuff out in the western part of the country is quite different. It's made out of different stone, unfortunately. It's mostly slate. Uh, and other stones that are quite soft, and it's become just a target for uh, the kind of destruction and vandalism that Richard has seen in the rock art. And, and quite different uh, styles of deer stones as well. So we don't know, you know what's going on to the west, and we don't know the connections between the, the so-called Eurasian deer stones and the classic type. Is it something that's moving west, uh, as it seems possible, but uh, the stuff around the Black Sea is so far not most of the deer stones that have been found out there have not been dated, and they're not in original context now. So it's a, it's a question. Here's some of the environmental uh, stories. We're dealing with the Kazakh area, uh, different architecture in Western Mongolia. Uh, we also have some of these wonderful peat bogs that have really deep peat accumulations that will give us a good vegetation history. There's quite a lot of, um, uh, of marginal irrigation that's going on here too. Uh, not, not obvious in the central part of Mongolia. And then you have these, uh, the winter places, which are almost certainly going to be the places where we might find settlement sites. Uh, it's underneath the, uh, the winter complexes of the Kazakh herders. We haven't had a chance to work on any of that kind of stuff. And the rock art, which you've seen, and so forth. I'll just go right through. Alignments is something Richard didn't mention, but there are a lot of stone alignments. Uh, we don't know exactly what they mean. This is a map put together by Dan Cole, which uh, shows some of the alignments. Sometimes they align towards uh, significant geographic features. Other times they don't. Uh, sometimes they appear to be corridors uh, for processions or maybe something else. Uh, but we don't really know what to make of these. So now I just wanted to go through some of the uh, archaeological material chronologically. This is some of the earliest stuff that we have found. It's going back almost 7,000 years. Uh, we have a, a small burial uh, within a, a circular arrangement with a little pavement on top. And on, on the lower right, you see uh, uh, a lot of stone features in the ground. Uh, this stuff is, is uh, among some of the older material for which we have archaeological context, but unfortunately we, didn't, we weren't able to dig uh, except this one grave. But it shows you way back then uh, we have uh, ceremonial activities and uh, mortuary uh, systems that actually look an awful lot like things that, that keep appearing in the, uh, in the mortuary history of this region. This is a very, uh, what we thought was quite interesting, double, sort of double or triple wall, rubble-filled rectangular walls with, uh, um, with these V-shaped troughs, four of them, and a central hearth. We don't know if it's a ritual site. Uh, they did, there are some uh, Neolithic flints uh, around, uh, scattered around. Uh, we got a nice radiocarbon date of almost 4,000 BP. 
from it, so that can make sense. Um, and there are a few of these others. Esther has, has documented one, and there are a few others that are, are known. Uh, up in the upper right is a, a rectangular feature with a with an oval hearth, and in front of that oval hearth was a big pit full of charcoal dating 3,500 uh, years ago. Uh, nothing else, uh, it's not a, it does not appear to be a house, uh, and it just, to me, seems like a, there are two of them side by side. It appears to be some sort of a, a ritual ceremonial feature of which uh, the bottom uh, uh, pictures may also be something like that. Here's another one, 3,800 years ago, a big hillside uh, uh, pavement within a circular border. It had been looted and disturbed, but we did get a, a, an old radiocarbon date for it in a very strange air, area, just sort of on the side of a hill, uh, looking over the, the countryside. Uh, here's uh, into the Herrickser period, uh, the Deerstone complex. Uh, and in the upper left here, you see a little stone that uh, Byra found uh, with these three slashes that you find on some of the deer stones, uh, including uh, the lower left here, a stone that had been embedded in one of the Herrickser's that we excavated and in that site you see on the, on the right-hand side. So this is the beginning of that, uh, that uh, Herrickser deer stone complex uh, material, which is so widespread uh, out into the western part of London. And it's just, yeah, there's lots and lots of it. Uh, you see some of the uh, simple deer stones. There's a lot of the, these Eurasian deer stones, very simple. Uh, clearly something different is going on in terms of the uh, reduced frequency of the classic type of deer stone uh, in Western Mongolia. Uh, this is the only site in, in a lot of our surveys out there where we found horse mounds. Uh, this is a square herrickser with a typical you know, mound, and around it was a series of uh, horse uh, burial features with the heads and the, uh, and the uh, cervical vertebrae and hooves. It's the, it's the only one, and uh, it's, it's quite unique. It appears to be kind of like an intrusion into Western Mongolia of the complex from, from the east, but it dates to exactly the same time period as all the other uh, herrickser's that we find and the deer stones in Western Mongolia. Here we have a, another herrickser uh, with a burial of, a, of an infant or a young person with its head uh, cocked 90 degrees from the body facing uh, the east. And um, uh, just a strange, uh, sort of a strange, no feet on this, on this individual either uh, for some reason. Uh, here's some other burials. This is the same time period would be as the early dating for the Harrisburg complex, but here it, it's a mound uh, with just a flex burial in it. Uh, so we're obviously we're getting, you know, at the same time that you have the Harrisburg material starting, you have uh, uh, other kinds of small, small circular features that look like that 6,000 year old period material. So, you know, are we talking about a resident population that is sort of continuing, has a long tradition of this very simple type of interments? Uh, and, and it continues maybe uh, before and after uh, Herrickser. So we're, we're at a dividing, sort of a cultural dividing area in the Altai where some of these things may be overlapping at different time periods. Here's another one, uh, another one of these circular graves um, <coughs> with, a, with a burial 3200 in the early, uh, that early time period. This is a later, a uh, little bit later, 3000, from a date uh, square feature. This is, I don't know the cultural material. Uh, some of you will know this better than me, but I understood that this is something related to what is called Silver Forest or Mangun Taiga culture. Uh, and we got a, a date of 3,000 years. There's this a whole cemetery that there were nine of these uh, grave features, and the bodies were, the body we one we excavated was wrapped in felt, uh, which was preserved. Here's another one in that time period of the, the Herrickser complex time period, uh, just on the side of the hill, uh, with just a bit of cranial fragments left in it, but, but no Herrickser uh, formation. Uh, the Pazrit period, uh, Byra dug, uh, Byra Khan dug uh, one of these, a uh, very typical uh, Pazrit uh, type of grave with the, the characteristic horse pit, a little bit of gold foil, uh, 
art and uh, peasant style pottery and so forth and, and a uh, interment with a horse uh, skeleton. Um, the human skeleton was missing, but the grave goods were found underneath. We think this might have been looted, but the looters did not find the sub-burial. Um, so what are they doing? This, there's uh, theories that maybe this is not uh, digging for artifacts, but digging to remove bodies uh, of people who you don't like, who you have replaced, uh, maybe cultural replacement of some kind. Uh, here, this is another large a uh, little bit later time period, early Iron Age, uh, and we had a very nice uh, cyst grave with uh, sheep bones and food remains on the outside of the stone uh, stone chamber and a, and a body inside. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, a lot of pottery uh, with this uh, particular site. This is also around uh, late Iron Age time or Iron Age time period. So there's a lot of things that are going on that we really can't figure out. Um, and this had a lot of quartzite, chips of quartzite, worked, worked stone all among these boulders. So what, what are they doing with uh, a lot of quartzite activity in an Iron Age uh, site? Uh, here's a, uh, a Turkic feature. This is the arrows show you this big 30 meter wide and, and long uh, structure with a lot of uh, Turkic features inside. We have the, the classic Turkic memorial sites with the uh, figures of the head and square uh, interiors with animal bones, charred animal bones, and ball balls, and things like that. Uh, so this is, we have a very strong uh, uh, Turkic period uh, signature in the landscape. Uh, and you see, you see more of it here. You see these linked mounds that may start in Pazirik and go into Turkic time period. Um, and uh, features that look like long uh, rectangular features. Uh, in the upper right was a little, uh, memorial of some kind with a standing stone uh, and, and another stone looking like a human and a birch bark quiver with three arrows uh, found in it as well as pottery and so on. So we're starting to you know piece these things together. Another one, here's a, a date in the Mongol period with uh, two stone, little stone boxes like shoe boxes and a, a little bench area on the side of the ring. Uh, you can just imagine somebody, you know, maybe uh, coming to observe something about the deposits in those boxes, maybe human fetal remains or, or something else. Uh, there's Will up there with his hands in one of the boxes, trying to see what he might find. And then the oboes. This is from our Tolgoy. We found three chains of oboes up there. Uh, so this is a, sort of maybe a continuation of some of the ritual activities. There's a series of them, some of them 15, 20 oboes long. Are they sequential? Are they each yearly deposits? We, we, we dug one and found a nice radiocarbon sample about 900 uh, years uh, old in one of them, charred bone and, and so forth. So clearly the ovo tradition uh, you know, has a long history in this part of the world, and maybe is coming out of some of the earlier ritual things that we see. Uh, here's a Mongol period grave, the skeleton that was buried on the edge of a mound, apparently to try to keep it from being disturbed, with a little gaming piece and, and iron arrows uh, here. Um, we found um, at the top of a hill on the lower right a little uh, mound and a, and, a, and a circle hearth with, a, with an iron arrow, arrow point in it. In a nice, uh, quite recent date. That's the end of the talk. <laughs> so I, th I just thought it would be, uh, you know, there is something going on with, with ritual activity, and, and this is really what the archaeology is all about, at least when you're looking at the landscape uh, out in Western Mongolia. There's a long tradition of, uh, of this type of activity, and it, and it, it appears to be one that is not influenced always by the big events. Uh, characters, yes, but for instance, uh, Shonu period, there, we, there are none of the big Shonu graves around. Uh, and so I have an idea that this is mostly activity of, of peoples who are living in the, in the mountain region uh, and who persist for a long time with many ideas that just go on and on. And they occasionally they get inter, uh, interfered with by big things that happen in other areas.